Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to notify the viewers of this channel about a new blog post, which I'd like you to check out immediately. This is um, from a blog which I have mentioned before in this channel. It's uh, one of my favorites on the internet. Uh, this is Michael Lindsay's blog, and the latest post is titled Vanity Fair, Ambition, and the English Condition. Now, this is, of course, a critique of uh, that famous 19th century uh, British novel Vanity Fair, which I admit I have not read yet, uh, in that I recall seeing it once um, for sale at a used bookstore I used to frequent in a Denver when I lived in America years ago, but um, even though I, I kind of picked it up and took a look at it, thought for a moment about giving it a shot, um, I put it down because I um, was intimidated, quite frankly, by the sheer size of the novel, but also um, by the reputation it had of being a quote-unquote difficult book. I'd heard a few people mention that over the years. Well, this is something which Lindsay deals with right from the start of his essay. He admits that um, it is a book which, um, especially to somebody accustomed to uh, a Dan Brown-paced thriller novel, which, you know, by the way is um, even that is too much for the average American to read, but still, if one does read, usually it has to be something like that. A very fast-paced, um, suspenseful, exciting, um, easy to follow the cast of characters. Well, in Vanity Fair is a 19th century um, novel, and, and a fairly large one, if I recall correctly. Um, you have a, a cast of characters, which um, is uh, difficult to keep track of for multiple reasons. On the one hand, um, it's a, as large as, uh, I think he compares it to, like, the, the scope of a Simpsons cast. And the interesting thing about that is, um, if you watch The Simpsons, um, as, as I did when I lived in America years ago and still watch television, that was my favorite show, um, you might have noticed that uh, Bart Simpson has been in the, uh, the fourth grade for about 33 years. So no matter how much time passes, time really doesn't pass. It's kind of like almost um, 50 First Dates that really terrible Adam Sandler movie in which um, the girl has to wake up every morning and fall in love all over again with a guy she thinks she's never met before but is actually her husband she's been married to for years. So um, this shows that uh, on a properly uh, hermeneutical circle level understanding of time, um, you really can't have um, a future or expectations about the future is what that really is um, if you don't have a past or more precisely if you don't have memories of things in the past if your memory is wiped um, you lose the past and the future both because um, you can only form the future by compounding it with all of those memories from the past so if you're stuck in living the same day over and over again um, time will on a certain level be passing without really passing. And, and you might argue this is what uh, is going on in The Simpsons, because um, as I recall from watching many episodes of that show years ago, um, the, there's never really any references to past episodes. Have you noticed this? Um, you kind of start right in the middle of the, the lives of The Simpsons, um, and things that happen in one episode are never really brought up again in another, okay? So they're almost like um, stuck in, in a continuous present for the same reason. So um, with that... Um, you know, a floodgate open. You you can have a huge number of characters, maybe spatially, uh, because time itself is not really passing. Well, maybe that's how we explain um, the huge cast of characters within The Simpsons, uh, but within Vanity Fair, um, the characters are hard to keep track of for other reasons. Lindsay notes himself that... Um, in uh, line with the uh, conventions of 19th century uh, British uh, politeness or whatever, um, you refer to these characters, and there are many, um, by their title, Mr. Such and Such, rather than by their first name, until later within the same novel, you're able to be on first, uh, you know, you're able to tutoyer them um, and uh, refer to them in... Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, informal terms, rather. Um, and at that point, the reader is kind of scratching their head saying, well, who the hell is this guy? I thought he was Mr. Such and Such. So uh, that is a challenge, especially once again to... Um somebody who is uh, used to, at best, maybe the uh, Dan Brown uh, style, uh, fast-paced uh, thriller novel. So that is one thing which maybe has to be overcome. But the substance of the novel itself is what um, that Lindsay discusses within this essay, or rather, perhaps, the lack of substance, which is, in a certain sense, the theme of the novel. And to understand that, we have to consider the title itself. Now, Vanity Fair is itself a reference to a 17th century text um, called The Pilgrim's Progress, which uh, Lindsay um, notes was at one time among the most uh, widely read uh, books within the English language, along with, uh, 
I guess, the King James Bible and um, the Book of Common Prayer, okay? And um, it was a, a story which, in line with, uh, say, the uh, Protestant sensibilities of Edmund Spencer, it's an allegory trying to teach you a spiritual lesson, but it tries to uh, make as explicit as possible what the characters stand for. So you have this very literal naming of characters within Spencer's The Fairy Queen. Um, Archimago is the arch magician, the chief magician, who is, of course, Satan himself. Um, Duessa is the false church of duplicity or the Roman church, and Una is the one true church of the elect, um, not meaning to open that can of worms, but just saying that's the way that Spencer, as a as, as a Elizabethan Protestant, tried to frame his allegory to make it as clear as possible what the spiritual or religious message was. Well, similarly within Pilgrim's Progress, you have a not so subtly um, named protagonist, Christian, making a journey. Um, overcoming one, I guess, temptation after another. I actually haven't read Pilgrim's Progress myself, but um, Lindsay notes that at one point within the text, uh, one of the challenges or hurdles he has to overcome is Vanity Fair. Now, Vanity Fair is something of maybe an illusion. It's a performance like maybe a puppet show, which um, is uh, created um, to uh, feed, in a certain sense, the vanity which one has on a spiritual level, um, but it also is vain in the sense that behind this illusion, there's nothing. It's actually just constructed by uh, one of the chief demons, Beelzebub himself. And the um, connection between vanity and, and ambition that you see within the title of this essay is made kind of explicit even within the 17th century text. Basically, what you see put on display to feed your vanity is vain because um, it's simply all of the fantasies which one might use one's um, imagination, or rather abuse one's imagination by the standards of that time to um, project as though it were real, um, but which if you tried to seize it in the real world, um, first of all, it wouldn't really be possible because there's no substance behind it, but even if you did act on it, um, the result would not be good. And the connection to ambition is um, basically sociological. If you try to um, imagine a different life than the life which you were ordained to have, um, the result of acting on that desire would be bad not just for you as an individual, but for society as a whole. And this is um, an attitude which presupposes a kind of society which, on memological grounds, perhaps we might say, um, is uh, one that needs to have cycles repeat. So if you inherited a place within society from all of your ancestors, you're repeating a cycle that goes back much further than you, and you're supposed to, quite frankly, marry within your own level of society and have your children fill the same role. And um, this is something which you really could not even change because the broader social whole is already complete, because in line with the um, memological view of, of the circle, um, there's no need to make the circle more complete because it's already complete because the inner underlying shape is like this. Okay, But uh, fast forward to the 19th century and we suddenly have a very different attitude on ambition. Now, this is made even worse in our era, in which lack of ambition is arguably one of the only remaining sins which you could commit, along with, of course, violence, as Ted Kaczynski noted, though it's interesting that um, the violence is not always outlawed. Of course, Kaczynski noted that um, if the, uh, the, the, the technological system itself is using violence for things like deforestation, destroying countless wild animals, actually the whole species rather than just individuals, that's always allowed, even in a society in which the individual is not allowed to... Um, act in any unpredictable way whatsoever, but of course there's an exemption extended also to um, the uh, leftoid or SJW violence, which um, if it's uh, advancing the interest of electing Democrats and um, targeting um, targets that uh, the media had already uh, designated as legitimate, that's also allowed, but of course that's a can of worms we don't have to open right now. Uh, but the idea basically... Um, by um, the 21st century is that, that lack of ambition is itself a vice because you have to use your imagination to try to, um, you know, fantasize about a, a better or rather a higher um, position within society than the one you were born into. And um, if you don't do that, there's something wrong with you morally. Okay, uh, you, it's, it's literally unethical not to try to advance yourself. Well, this presupposes a kind of society in which change... Um, is a good in itself because it's, on a moral level, I mean, because it's already necessitated on, you might say, an economic level, okay, but really more so on a technological level, I would say. And um, this is, of course, the era which you get in the 19th century and 
the 21st where we're living now, but you don't have in the 17th century because what happened between those centuries is, of course, the 18th, in which you have, um, you might say, the Industrial Revolution at a certain level. You might say the rise of capitalism. I would say, um, of course, the rise of modern technique, as Elul noted, but also um, on a somatic level, you have um, uh, a coal-based society with in England, um, which really is the shift of the fossil fuels. And the, the most basic shape that things are supposed to have, even if you don't realize this consciously, shifts from the complete circle, which you can't add to, and which um, doesn't, you know, just uh, stay still. It repeats the cycle every year, or whatever, every generation, um, to instead the uh, linear arrow, arrow of progress, in which things have to constantly get better, or um, rather they have to constantly advance in a, a, a direction which, of course, is denominated in terms that are purely technological, economic, and materialistic. And the kind of ambition which one is supposed to have um, in modernity, by the way, is not really the ambition of simply bettering yourself. If you have the ambition of philosophizing and seeking out wisdom and really thinking, okay, and using your mind and um, thinking about the thoughts of other greatest thinkers within um, history, like, say, Plato and Aristotle and Aquinas and, um, and, and Dante and Cervantes, well, that's not really the kind of ambition which they're talking about. And they're only talking about the kind of ambition in which you seize more material wealth for yourself by gaming the system to reach a higher position. And that's what this novel also is, is really about. You have this um, um, yeah, cast of characters, um, the most prominent of which, um, if I understand correctly from reading uh, Lindsay's essay, um, are the characters who are acting out on their ambition, but not their ambition, once again, to seek out wisdom or to use their mind to things like that, um, rather their ambition simply to seize more material wealth. Well, what kind of society is it in which that would become the ultimate virtue unless it was a society in which there really was a surplus of material wealth because there really was a surplus of energy from fossil fuels? And this is, of course, really, I think, a novel about um, the, the mimological shift, if you will, um, from the, the circle to the arrow. And um, the um, interesting thing, however, about that is referencing Vanity Fair, something which before was understood to be an empty fantasy, which, um, you know, uh, Satan might tempt you to um, think about, or you might abuse your imagination to um, fantasize about, but it, behind which there's actually no substance. Well, the interesting thing is, now that ambition and um, desire, acting on desire, you have to desire a better um, position in life than the one you have. You have to desire more wealth, and then you have to, of course, desire all of the commodities that you can buy with that wealth, which you didn't know you wanted until corporate marketers told you you were supposed to want them, otherwise you wouldn't even think about them. I mean, you, you have to desire now, whereas you had to repress the desire before. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that even with that shift, on a metaphysical level, behind the illusion, there's still nothing. Now, you might argue, how could that possibly be the case? Because um, here we're not um, dabbling in, um, in uh, spiritual or religious matters. We're sp strictly speaking in uh, materialistic terms about the kind of commodities which you can possess with money if you game the social system in the right way. And how could you say that there's no substance behind a materialist society? Well, the interesting thing about that, which um, Lindsay notes himself in a very uh, well um, phrased way, which I would like to actually just uh, quote for you, he notes that um, the vanity even within this novel, is exactly the spirit of unsustainability, it is a narcissistic projected image without bedrock or substance. But this is in the um, literal sense that um, in the novel, the characters who have to put forward their best public appearance for society. Okay. Um, in which case, they're, you know, once again, not only acting on their own desires, but they're also trying to um, gauge the desire of the other within that society. I have to act in the way that they desire me to in order to advance myself within a system in which it really is not enough to um, be good at something on an individual level. You have to be well connected. You have to know the right people. What better example of this in the academic industry? Being the best, um, you know, uh, Plato or Aristotle uh, scholar in the whole wide world isn't enough. You have to really be well connected with dozens, maybe hundreds of people in high positions of power in in order to get ahead. And um, what we have, ironically, in um, the way that this is exemplified in the 19th century novel is the revelation that behind that you have this, um, this lack of substance, which cannot merely be described with maybe the neutral terms of there's just the, the void of, of zero 
numerically speaking. No, actually, what we have behind that appearance is negative in the all too literal financial sense of being the negative number of debt. Lindsay says himself, the vacuity of Rodon and Rebecca's lavish lifestyle becomes quite literal as they maintain all of it on empty credit and Rodon's cheating at gambling. So we have disreputable means of, of gaining money. He's not I guess, working a job or whatever. He's uh, basically swindling other people in the uh, the casino or whatever and taking their money. That's a lot of what gam being successful at gambling actually is, right? Um, and then uh, they're just borrowing a mountain of unpayable debt, and that's how they fund this public appearance, which looks very good, um, but of course costs a ton of money to maintain, um, at, but behind which there's not only nothing, but the, the negative number of a ton of debt, okay? And this is a paradox which I think really is proper to the fossil fuel mentality, because um, you have the um, illusion of more, where there's the reality of less, is simply a way of talking about fossil fuels. I've mentioned many times before in the past that um, when, once you start um, uh, using fossil fuels, you inevitably get yourself stuck in a economic feedback loop in which you have to use more the following year than the previous year just to avoid collapse. And um, it's interesting that the U.S. economy only shrunk 1.5% last quarter, which seems rather small, but that's still an absolute crisis because um, even if it doesn't grow fast enough, that's treated the same as recession. Now we actually have it shrinking. Okay, And it's only shrinking by a little bit, but you can see the... Um, the kind of economic feedback loops which fossil fuels create, you have to have more each year, and you have to see more. It becomes an adaptive um, strategy from an evolutionary standpoint, says John Michael Greer. If you think in terms of progress in the early era of fossil fuels, you'll be able to make better predictions about the future, which will be rewarded in terms of Darwinian natural selection than people who gamble on a future in which there's less or the same amount. Well, once you get past the, the curve of peak oil, however, it's the exa exact opposite. If you're gambling on unlimited progress, you're actually making less accurate predictions than people who um, favor the latter options I mentioned. Well, um, applied to uh, this novel, we find the idea that there's um, there's more, right? There's supposed to be more, but there's really less. And oh, by the way, I wanted to finish that point also. Um, you you see more, but there's actually less because, of course, fossil fuels are a non-renewable resource, which we only have um, thanks to hundreds of millions of years of geological processes, which will not be able to repeat within our lifetimes, um, given the amount of time it takes. Um, so uh, y you're actually always having less. And you can't see, even though common sense tells you that if you're using it, it's disappearing, you can't see the reality of depletion because um, you've been forced to see instead the exact opposite, which is progress. So we have a reality of less, a, an illusion of more, which really is, I think, the theme of um, even this novel itself. Um, applied to people. They become uh, the, the countersense object of people who look like they're very wealthy and... and, uh, and uh, and um, uh, very presentable to society, right? Uh, but behind that appearance of wealth is um, actually not just nothing, um, but the negative number of how deep in debt they are. And this is something I think you see not coincidentally in also the greatest novelist of the 19th century, Honoré de Balzac. Balzac is somebody who um, wrote uh, uh, the, the human comedy as something of a, I don't know if it's a sequel is a right word or something inspired by Dante's Divine Comedy because the Divine Comedy showed you um, hell, purgatory, and heaven, all of it, regardless of the extreme suffering you see in hell, and of course, uh, how much courage would it take a medieval Catholic thinker to descend into hell and describe all of it. You, you still get to the full picture because Dante was a uh, a circular thinker, okay, as I mentioned in my book, Hermeneutical Death, I had a kind of lengthy uh, critique of, of Dante, um, and I, by the way, I've, I've started uh, rereading the, the comedy in Italian, I think I'll revisit that in a series of videos also, but um, at any rate, um, you have the, the Divine Comedy with Dante showing you all of it, but Baldack in the 19th century also wants to show you all of it, but on a social rather than divine order. You have the Human Comedy as a very detailed um, analysis of the whole of French society in the 19th century. And the way that he's able to show you all of it, Balzac scholars have noted, is um, he actually takes you behind closed doors. You get to see the inside of wealthy people's houses, and also, um, you know, just basically everybody's house, the inside of their apartment, um, their, their um, personal offices. You get to see the inside of the offices of, of bankers and merchants and things like that. And of course, you get to see even the bedroom, and um, you know, sexual scandal is a big part 
of Balzac's storytelling, which I think led him to be blacklisted by the Catholic Church. It was like immoral to read his works during his lifetime. Um, that's a, a part of um, the, the Balzac film with uh, Gérard Depardieu. But at any rate, um, you... Um, have this irony in which um, the sexual scandal is not the most um, uh, disgraceful thing you get to see. It's not the most shocking thing. You have, on the one hand, um, Valerie Marneff, um, the adulteress in Cousin Bet, um, seducing old men and driving their um, families into financial ruin, um, and then is uh, punished for it at the end of the novel uh, by uh, catching what appears to be a sexually transmitted disease that basically makes her, her once pretty face melt grotesquely um, into formlessness as sort of a divine punishment for the moral depravity she had displayed for the entire um, novel. But um, even, you know, this level of, of, of showing you the horror of a sexual scandal, that's only the second most shocking thing within the human comedy. Far worse, of course, then adulteresses and murderers are the usurers and debt collectors, the worst villains of all of French society. And let's keep in mind, there's some 90 novels of a varying length within the human comedy. It's a, it's a really big book. Um, the worst villains are just usurers. And um, this is something which, of course, Balzac um, did in line with his own personal experiences of being deep in debt for his whole life and being pursued by, um, by these debt collectors. And he goes into extreme detail about all the things they can do to you if you read um, uh, César uh, Bichotto, um, it's extreme the amount of detail he gives about what debt collectors are able to do to people I mean, in the 19th century in accord with the laws of the 19th century and in France. Um, but um, this idea that they're the worst people in society, um, even worse than murderers, well, that's something you also see in Dante, because in, in Dante's Inferno, the, the usurers also have a lower uh, circle of hell than murderers. And um, what this really shows, I think, is that for Balzac, the, the deepest secret about a person behind their carefully tailored public appearance, and he does note in various novels that um, the appearance which people put forth in um, 19th century French society is something which not only um, is 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 um, carefully crafted in accord with many many social rules which are very um, intentionally obscured and complicated okay uh, but it's also literally expensive it costs a ton of money he makes a big deal in the novels about the amount of money uh, it takes to produce to, to buy just like one hat. Um, to be presentable, I think in uh, um, Eugène uh, Rastignac, um, he um, he has to spend like a whole year's worth of a salary as a law student just for one hat to be able to go to some duchess's um, house and present himself. And um, it costs a ton of money, but um, behind that appearance, in which you see this excess of a ton of money, there's the reality about the person of just how deep in debt they are. And once again, the deepest truth about a person in Balzac society um, even beyond their, their um, scandalous uh, sexual um, um, <laughs> um, um, truths behind closed doors, for lack of a better word, even beyond that, more embarrassing is just how much money they owe to the debt collectors. And um, it's only in the era of fossil fuel modernity in which you can have this coincidence of opposites. You have the illusion of more and the reality of less. And this extends even in our era to um, the, the richest man in the world. You have um, Elon Musk, somebody in the news recently um, for reasons related to Twitter, but um, one thing which um, they were also trying to out him for was that he's um, not as rich as he appears to be. This is something they did with Trump also when he was running for president in 2016. Well, what if he's not as rich as he, as he wants you to think he is? And what they did with um, Elon Musk was they showed that um, even the world's richest man, who, who can buy Twitter outright, um, actually does not live on um, a huge mass of money he has built up over his life um, from, from all of his business ventures. Instead, he uses his ownership of things like factories to qualify for another loan. And it's that borrowed money which even the world's richest man lives on to pay his day-to-day -day expenses. So we have this paradox in which even, once again, the, the image of the greatest excess of wealth maybe in human history is Elon Musk, at least on paper, is also somebody who's living day-to-day on the negative territory of debt. And this is something we take for granted today as normal, but I think Balzac, um, and also in Vanity Fair, they're both early-ish 19th century novels. They're early enough within the memological shift from um, the circle to the fossil fuel-based arrow to see the scandal of debt for what it is, and to see even more so the scandal of this nothingness, this negativity behind the appearance of an excess of wealth and carefully crafted public appearances, they, they're, they're able to see it for what it really is. And this is something which I think is um, 
particularly relevant today because we're living in the midst of another memological shift as we speak. The memological shift from the fossil fuel-based era of progress to the bell curve of decline and salvage. And if you want more information on that, I'd recommend you to check out, at the very least, my earliest uh, book. It's only $3.75 on me transcendental memology. And, of course, that will have to be a subject for another video, but at any rate, I recommend you to check out this um, this essay, and I'll certainly be reading the book myself, uh, Vanity Fair, um, and uh, this is something which, once again, uh, I think is a discussion we need to be having right now.